it's really over. <laughs> they say all things must come to an end, and after 30 years, Power Rangers finally got that memo. And like all goodbyes, the show ending is bittersweet. We all look back fondly when in reality the last few years have been terribly mid, and that's being generous. But fans of the show are used to saying their farewells with the casts rotating every one to two seasons. Power Rangers as a show that constantly reinvented itself with a new theme every year has certainly introduced many a new team, but with that, they've closed the curtains on them as well. But one thing I noticed was the show can really go all out when a season ends. At least, they used to. Let's look back at the finales of Power Rangers and how the best stories come from bookending a year. And don't say I didn't warn ya, but spoilers for like all the endings. We all know Power Rangers is a formulaic show. That's not anything unique to it. Look at procedural dramas or medical shows. It's the same old song and dance of fighting a guy in a monster suit and learning a moral lesson about teamwork or whatever. But when we break away from that pattern, it's somehow more exciting. Ever since our little monkey brains developed to find more than just a big red butt attractive, from a survival point of view, patterns help us predict what's coming up next. It allows us to know if there's danger around the corner, thus leading us to be more comfortable when things around us are familiar. For the most part, Power Rangers doesn't stray outside of the season requisite team-up episode and a few others here and there, but for the final episodes, or even the episodes leading up to them, the stakes are elevated. Our heroes aren't necessarily any more comfortable. Like any good story, we eventually reach a boiling point, whether that be the Rangers getting caught off guard, finding out their greatest enemy is alive after previously believing they were out of the picture, or villains having enough of the same routine backstabbing each other until there's one left, one dangerous foe without anything holding them back, or just ending on a Christmas special. That was the case for the first five years of the show. See, the first six seasons of Power Rangers were one interconnected story and was, for the most part, non-serialized. Check out my last video for more on that. There was sort of a proto-finale in the form of the season 1 two-parter Doomsday. The Rangers are up the wall against a powerful enemy. The Japanese footage implies that this isn't your normal everyday monster attack. This is clearly a final boss, a giant demonic floating head bleeding from its eyes. But the plot of the American footage doesn't necessarily convey that. The Rangers aren't challenged as characters, at least more than usual, and it instead ends on the city's so-called Power Rangers Day festivities. The Rangers are eventually given the choice whether to stay as Rangers or return to being regular teens. But with how more episodes would air after Doomsday, it feels out of place. This was never their last hurrah, so why bring it up? Well, Doomsday was originally intended to be the series finale, but due to the show's massive popularity, more episodes were ordered ahead of it. We wouldn't get a proper ending until Season 3 of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, or technically Season 3.5, the Mighty Morphin Alien Rangers miniseries, with a two-parter called Hog Day Afternoon. Long story short, the Rangers are sent to the past to retrieve the pieces of the Zeo Crystal to restore time. Time travel shenanigans and all that. Unfortunately, this means the rangers were turned into children, meaning the alien rangers of the planet Aquatar need to fill in. It's uh, cooler than it sounds, I think. Our main rangers retrieve the Zeo Crystal, age themselves back up, and then say goodbye to the alien rangers. And then... Rangers, you must evacuate the command center! <laughs> Oh, the command center, their base of operations blows up. Yeah, our favorite goons, Goldar and Rito, are responsible, but it's really all to set up the premiere of the following season, Power Rangers Zeo. Zeo didn't have a proper finale, instead ending on a bizarre Christmas episode, but the fifth season, Power Rangers Turbo, gave us our first taste of an ending done right. Teased in an earlier episode of Turbo, called The Millennium Message, Main villainess and dummy pirate mommy Divatox receives word that the United Alliance of Evil will be converging to conquer the universe. Now, Turbo isn't exactly a fan favorite season, but it does have early seeds for what makes future seasons so great, one of them being small serialized elements that recur throughout, as well as not being afraid to do massive tonal shifts when needed. This resulted in Turbo's finale episodes, Chase Into Space. For as comedic a villain as she is, 
Divatox was damn effective, actively causing confusion and distracting the rangers. In this episode, she downright exhausts them with a powerful monster that destroys both their megazords. It's a battle of attrition, as she strikes the rangers while they're not on their A-game. The rangers retreat into the power chamber, only for the lights to dim and piranatrons repel down from the ceiling. It's bleak. The rangers' base is a recurring element of Power Rangers, and it's always shocking to see it absolutely wrecked. Unlike when the command center exploded in Mighty Morphin, which is more of a shock value moment, you can feel the absolute defeat of the rangers here. Yet, they rise up from the rubble, ranger suits torn up as they figure out their plan. And yes, this also leads into the following season's premiere. But it does a much better job to convey that they can't just brute force their way out of this mess. On top of that, the rangers have been punched down so hard, yet they refuse to give up in the face of defeat, making the cliffhanger into the next season more motivated on our main character's decision to blast off into space to chase an alien pirate. Of course, this leads us to what the fans would agree is the quintessential finale of them all. Countdown to Destruction, a finale so beloved that they tried ripping it off down the line. A countdown to destruction? And I can see the appeal to take cues from this one, but you also have to understand that this was the culmination of six years worth of story. Most fans already know how the episodes play out, but for those that don't, the United Alliance of Evil finally launches their all-out assault on the universe different planets and their respective Power Rangers simply being outnumbered. It's poetic injustice as the one trait that the Power Rangers embody, teamwork, is being used against them as several villains work together to conquer everything. The Space Rangers, in a familiar state of defeat, four of them being the former Turbo Rangers who just were at their lowest one year ago, get one last fight in them after the citizens of Earth refuse to give them up. We are the Power Rangers. Andros, the Red Space Ranger, confronts his sister, who's in charge of the evil forces. It's a great finale in that the hype was properly built up, not just over the season, but over the years. The show has done a total 180 since the first season of Mighty Morphin. They went from a pig monster starting a food fight to making the ultimate sacrifice to save the universe. What was said sacrifice? I don't know, I think it has something to do with that guy in a tube. He's probably not that important, if I'm being honest. Could be wrong but I'm pretty sure he's one of those Russian homunculuses. Yeah. Countdown to Destruction had it all. You felt the pressure on the Rangers. It was really nerve-wracking, and unlike other finales we've had so far, it felt like there was no undo button. Choices were made, and they were permanent. At least until the main villainess was revived and turned good thanks to the magic of tears and friendship. Damn it, you were so close. But even the show recognized how great the two-parter was by including it in their Best of Power Rangers DVD compilation. The finales for the next few years would actually all be pretty solid, but let's take a detour and skip ahead to the Disney era. I'm not sure what it was. Maybe it was something in the water in New Zealand where they've moved filming locations starting with Ninja Storm, but Power Rangers finales became... tropey. The direction Disney went with the show after buying it was very clearly different from what came before. They took less risk and simplified itself. This was clear in the finales where they would take the best or most memorable elements, tropes of previous ones, and work them in, but it just felt soulless. Take for example the destruction of the base, a classic finale trope that we've already mentioned. It happens in almost every Disney finale in some form, if not destroyed, at least infiltrated. Jungle Fury was the only one that escaped this. It's visually fun for sure, but they no longer need the set, so why not go all out and wreck them? But they ended up becoming more like cheap spectacles, rather than hitting the rangers where they feel the safest. I think what makes them not work in comparison to previous finales is that they aren't really integrated into the story. You can cut almost all of it or have events take place elsewhere and they'd have a similar, if not better, impact. It seems like including things for the sake of checking off a checkbox was their MO. Disney era Power Rangers had some of the worst cases of 11th hour saves. These have been around in the past too, but were at least often out of the Rangers control. Ninja Storm, Dino Thunder, Mystic Force, and Jungle Fury all defeated their final villain by harnessing or combining their powers into one concentrated attack, something that they apparently can just do out of nowhere. So why didn't they do that from the start? We may not be Power Rangers, but we still have power! Oh! I summon the power of the gem! Dino Gems unite! Give me that magic! You got it! Ah! 
Penultimate episodes, something more common in finales from Lost Galaxy through Wild Force, just don't exist. At least the ending elements are for the most part self-contained with the final episodes. You get less buildup, so suddenly there's this rush to finish things out. Now it ain't all bad, we've gotten some great moments such as an SPD when Jack decides to step down, or RPM delivering its message of human perseverance in a world of machine overlords. But overall, the Disney finales are just mid. They do the job, but it's the difference between passing the class and graduating with honors. But post-2010, the Neo-Saban and Hasbro eras of the show takes it all to new lows. Starting with Samurai, what was previously one season would be split into two, Samurai and its second season, Super Samurai, Megaforce and Super Megaforce, Dino Charge and Dino Super Charge. You get the point, we've done this before. But this means that sometimes we get an intermediary finale between the first and second seasons of each iteration. And they're usually... Nothing. Oh, oh hey, the, the magic, magic punch! punch. It's not quite a proper finale, but they'll take one major story element and elevate it just to feel like, um, something. Samurai's intermediary finale, called The Ultimate Duel, is just an ordinary episode. I get it, it's a major part of the story, focusing on the rivalry between Red Samurai Ranger Jaden and the recurring Nylock villain Decker, but it works better in the middle rather than the rear cap to the story. Ninja Steel tries to center its finale on a thread at least, that the Rangers get their ninja power stars taken. But if an episode has to have a cringy sitcom fart sequence, I don't think I need to justify why it's a bad finale. They treat it like it's a final episode, having them lose their powers, but they get them back conveniently at the start of the next season with no lead up or attempt to change the formula. Tell me, how does it feel to be beaten by Galvanax? Oh, Kyle. It's just back to the status quo like nothing happened. Some were actually okay, not good, but comparatively did something to warrant the feel of a mid-season finale that a regular TV show would do. Megaforce to Super Megaforce set up an alien invasion for its finale that lasted all but a few episodes and then swept under the rug. Rangers, morph now! What? Why? Morph, morph, morph! Quick, go! How can I ever thank? Go! Dino Charge ended by giving us a new ranger, which I'm actually a fan of. It's kind of a positive reinforcement thing. We had never had a female purple ranger before, and now that's a thing. Too bad the next season lost anything good it had going for it and spits on the concept of time and evolution, but we'll get to that. Dino Fury technically covers three seasons, with Cosmic Fury being Return of the Jedi. For season 2's finale, The Nemesis, it has a great new sequence of the rangers scaling a giant monster, a la Shadow of the Colossus. only for the plan to immediately not work, which shows their priorities. It's a great visual moment, but it wasn't integrated well enough that it mattered. We did get a ranger death. That got reversed as soon as they found out they're getting another season, so they said, quick, revive him in the last 10 seconds. We need to leave it on a cliffhanger now that we're getting greenlit. As for the proper finales in the second season of each iteration, third in the case of Dino slash Cosmic Fury, they aren't much better. To be honest, it's like they took great, sound ideas, but ignored the fact that they had to write a story around them. Super Megaforce's finale, Legendary Battle, was supposed to be a big team-up reunion, but it amounted to wasted cameos where some of the returning actors didn't even get lines. It was supposed to be this great battle with every single Power Ranger, but as usual, the bare minimum left it hollow. Why are they here? Where did they come from? What are you doing here? It's the sequel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this finale was so out there and poorly explained that they had to go back and retcon an explanation during Dino Fury. We wouldn't need to go back in the first place had the writing just not been total shit, but that's just my opinion. Dino Supercharge is notorious for its ending End of Extinction, a good Power Rangers finale supposed to be inspirational, or at least leaves you with a sense of pride in that these are heroes and also people who put themselves on the line. But when your final episode has the rangers on the Jumbotron asking everyone on Earth to hold up mirrors to reflect the sun's rays into a black hole, I don't even know how I can take this piece of crap seriously. I know the show's known for its 90s cheese, but it's not the 90s anymore, and kids nowadays know better. In fact, they will see this and cringe at it. So who's this even for? Who are they fooling with this kind of writing? As a writer, one of the things you need to earn is a sense of respect for the audience's intelligence. Now let's see how it looks so far. 
this isn't exclusive a concept for just finales, but it astounds me how the writers didn't look at the scripts and think, wow, is this a satisfying conclusion to our story? Will audiences like it? They're actively writing against the audience. They're just trying to reach the finish line by whatever means necessary. That's why we get silly endings like stopping the extinction of the dinosaurs and altering the space-time continuum to make Jurassic Park real. Amazing. Whatever hard drugs these writers were on to not see a problem, I want that. Funny enough, during Super Ninja Steel's team-up special, Dimensions in Danger, they retcon this ending by saying all of Dino Charge takes place in an alternate dimension where the dinosaurs lived. The only finale that had some semblance of a good idea was Beast Morpher's twist that Evox was actually Vengex, the main villain of RPM who lay dormant for over a decade just to restart his robot apocalypse in another universe. And after the shock value of that revelation dissipates, it's more of the same. They used their one good idea and now it's downhill, they blew their load. It technically wasn't even the finale when this happened. This era of Power Rangers never really got a good ending. Cosmic Fury, the final season, had the best one since Samurai over a decade ago. In a twist on Countdown to Destruction, Lord Zed is turned into an equivalent of Zordon and sucked into an energy tube to be destroyed. And just like that finale causes a wave of energy that would spread throughout the whole universe. However, instead of eliminating all evil, will eliminate all good. Admittedly a clever twist on one of the most beloved finales. Now of course it misses the mark several times, the arrival of Deus Ex Morphin Master Zato helping the rangers by talking Lord Zed into giving up his powers in exchange for his freedom, that comes out of nowhere. But as it turns out, Zato was sent by Zordon himself, which takes Mighty Morphin Power Rangers once and always ending message of accepting loss and pummels it into the ground. And you may be thinking, these finales kinda suck. Well, we're not done yet, I've saved the best for last. The finales that took the best elements of the show and pushed them to their limits. Endings that took characters out of their element and tested their skills. Bookends that proved for the final time that these people were worthy to become Power Rangers. The post-Saban era is the back half of the show's run under its original ownership. Specifically, these were the seasons that followed in space. So, Lost Galaxy, Lightspeed Rescue, Time Force, and Wild Force. Let's talk about all four in order from great to downright amazing, my opinion by the way. Time Force's End of Time is a fantastic conclusion to the season, but to some it may be a shocker that I'm putting it beneath the other seasons. Relatively compared to every other season ever, it's still in the top percentile of good finales. Just don't murder me Time Force fans. This season ends with a message, letting go for the greater good, whether that be Wes sending his team back to the future against their will so he'll be the only one to die in battle, or Mr. Collins letting go of his greed, helping civilians in the middle of the chaos, or Rancic giving up on his crusade of self-made justice born out of prejudice for the sake of his daughter Nadira. It's not a message that's outright stated, but it comes up a lot in this finale. And just because it's the final three episodes, it doesn't mean the characters don't stop developing. Wes and Eric have this great exchange in part two of the finale. Eric has been standoffish towards Wes the whole season, and if this were a Neo Saban season, they just make up. But here, they don't. But they recognize that despite their differences, they're both Power Rangers and form a respect for one another. Sorry, I dropped my script on the ground. In a goofy scene that works surprisingly in their benefit, Trip forces Nadira to assist with a pregnant woman giving birth. It's comical, yet weirdly effective, showing that even a villain recognizing a medical emergency shows that there's some sympathetic side to being mutants. They're people too, but their goal of creating a better life for mutants in the future has grown so extreme. It took the miracle of childbirth to get Nadira to question her father's violent behavior. Hey! experience the miracle of birth again and again and again! Yeah, yeah, birth. Moving on to Lost Galaxy's journey's end, the rangers just came off of escaping the titular Lost Galaxy. They literally had to free a planet full of slaves in the previous episode. They could never do a plot like that again, that's for sure. Penultimate episodes leading up to the finale absolutely help sell the finality of it all, so I'll be bringing them up where they apply. Lost Galaxy had a weird little arc that I wouldn't necessarily say contributed to the finale, but it sure solidified one thing leading up to the end. Trakina is ruthless. She kills Captain Mutiny the episode before the finale and exclaims that there's only room for her. 
She had been absent for a good chunk of episodes prior to this, but it sets a reminder of how far she's come as a villain. At first, she was obsessed with trivial things like her beauty and not getting her hands dirty, but by the end, she's taken on her father's mantle, accepting that she needs to give up her old self and evolve into a full insect to defeat the rangers. Meanwhile, the Space Colony Ark, uh, I mean, the Terra Venture, is being absolutely destroyed. This is probably the craziest form of the base destruction trope, because Trakina effectively takes down a spaceship that houses a whole city. To make it even more crazy, she straps bombs onto her foot soldiers and commands them to self-detonate. The whole colony is forced to evacuate, and it's chaos. They eventually succeed, but Leo, this season's Red Ranger, finds himself alone on the abandoned Terra Venture, and it's freaky. Walking around an empty city, it's almost like a liminal space, only to find he's not alone. Overall, great finale. Wild Forces The End of the Power Rangers is a fitting name, but it has a double meaning. Yeah, it's the end of the season, but it was also originally the actual end of the show as a whole. Disney would buy the franchise while Wild Force was in pre-production. They had no plans to continue until they found a way and moved to New Zealand for Ninja Storm. But this finale serves as a great end for the characters involved, delivering on moments teased throughout the season. The villain, Master Org, after failing in his love life, goes ultimate incel and becomes the most powerful org in existence, harnessing the powers of pollution. He spreads toxic vines everywhere, which are a subtle set piece, but also show how much of a hold he has on everything. He's everywhere, and takes down the rangers easily, destroying their zords one by one. Mind you, this is one of the first seasons where all the zords are sentient. There's some great cinematography, showing the rangers clinging to the side of the floating island, the Animarium, as it plummets down to Earth. The final fight in the rain, and even the fight choreography, feel very well storyboarded. The first fight between the Wild Forest Rangers and Master Org feels like something out of an anime. For as cheesy as it is, the Wild Forest Rangers need to call out their names in a roll call, despite being powerless, goes insanely hard. Especially when you consider of all Power Rangers seasons, they're the only ones who lose their powers and still decide to fight. They've got nothing to lose, and that's impressive. Other seasons would have had Rangers lose their powers after the final battle, or give them secondary powers that work in their civilian mode outside of morphing into a Ranger. Say what you want about Wild Force, but they've really sold the hero aspect of the season. I realize I'm about to do some wordplay here considering it's an animal-based season, but Wild Force has a lot of pride in being a hero. The Rangers celebrate what they believe to be the end of the Orgs, whom they've been fighting throughout the whole year. We saved the world! The Power Rangers are all But they lament on the fact that they'll no longer be needed, that they'll go on living. But when it turns out there's one more job to do, the rangers don't hesitate to respond. They go all out on this finale to not give the rangers room to breathe. The writers made sure to embody the message of never give up, something the blue and black rangers Max and Danny say throughout the whole season. I actually don't necessarily place the show above Lost Galaxy's Journey's End, but they sort of tied in my opinion. But now, for the biggest baddest finale of them all. Don't miss the all-out adventure of Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue, the Queen's Wrath, for the biggest, baddest finale of them all. Yeah! I love Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue, easily my favorite season, and I feel up until recently, it hasn't gotten that much love. Actually, a lot of fans hated the season until Linkara came in to sing the praises of Red Ranger Carter Grayson, but no, I'm based. I liked it before it was cool. Anyway, I think the season's strength is in its unique concept. It's the first completely man-made power set in the series, with a military organization that they constantly show doing endless amounts of research and developing new weapons and zords in a fight against otherworldly beings. It's the most believable, dare I say realistic season, and yeah, I know they have a flying train. But nowhere is this more solidified than in the final four episodes. The finale itself, Fate of Lightspeed, is directly preceded by two episodes that aren't your typical penultimate lead-ups. They straight up feel like a combined four-parter. I'm guessing it helps that they released these four episodes on VHS back in the day, something I watched religiously and scared myself with. See my Horrors of Power Rangers video for why it did. For those who don't know about Lightspeed Rescue, it revolves around everyday heroes specializing in rescue services. There's the Red Ranger, Firefighter Carter Grayson, the Blue Ranger, Diver and Martial Artist Chad Lee, Green Ranger Joel Rawlings, a pilot, Yellow Ranger Kelsey Winslow, an extreme athlete, and 
paramedic Dana Mitchell, the Pink Ranger. They're brought together under Lightspeed, a paramilitary organization created to fight an ancient and unknown threat of demons. This season does not kid around with its practicality. Several times, the rangers are shown just responding to regular emergencies like fires, even when there aren't any monster attacks. Even little details like their base being fully underwater is a logical decision since they established that demons don't like water. Everything in the season feels grounded, which only made me connect to the world more. The finale begins with Wrath of the Queen, where the villainess, Queen Banshira, assumes her bodily form after becoming a deformed eldritch abomination in a previous episode. She does this by absorbing another villain's, Vipra's, life energy. Now, the villains have been backstabbing each other throughout the whole season. A lot of fans say that the villains of Lightspeed are boring and weak. And I do have to agree, Viper kind of sucks, but this season has Diabolico, Olympias, and Queen Banshira, whom I think are all great when you consider what their goals, motivations, and loyalties are. Anyway, the episode serves as an introduction to the full power of Queen Banshira's bodily form. She's openly manipulating her own followers, not caring if they kill each other. In a previous episode, she was even okay abandoning her son Olympias in literal hell, yet he's still loyal to her, poor kid. She wastes no time and kidnaps the rangers. It's only through the help of Diabolico does Carter find a way to stop her, but she immediately retaliates, fighting against the rangers Megazord in giant size. Of course, the rangers don't even get the chance to defeat her. In the following episode, Rise of the Super Demons, the rangers are immediately testing something new. This is something they did throughout the season. While it kind of comes out of nowhere, it isn't out of the realm of possibility that they're constantly finding new ways to fight the demons. Speaking of, Diabolico and Olympias fight each other. Diabolico feeling betrayed by the Queen. Unfortunately for him, he loses the fight and is brainwashed after being captured by Olympias. Queen Banshira sends the two out to destroy the Rangers. After a rather intense fight, Carter jogs Diabolico's memory by reminding him of Queen Banshira's backstabbing. Diabolico comes to, but is then immediately killed by Olympias. The Rangers return the favor and take care of him, only for the two to be revived by Banshira. It's not outright stated, but it plays out like it's part of the plan. In fact, both Olympias and Diabolico are brainwashed this time, essentially becoming puppets. They easily tear through the Super Train Megazord, Omega Megazord, and Lightspeed Solar Zord, leaving the Rangers with one Megazord left, the Life Force Megazord. It seems like a silly concept, but the Life Force Megazord draws on the Rangers' own life energy to power it, but this season in particular has actually established that life energy is a potent source of power. Trakina kidnaps humans and collects it during the Lost Galaxy crossover, Trakina's Revenge, and Queen Banshira absorbs Vipra to take her life energy in the previous episode. While the Rangers put their own lives at risk to put enough power into killing Diabolico and Olympias, and succeed. Meanwhile, Jinxer, another villain, places an evil Yu-Gi-Oh card on the back of the Life Force Megazord's leg, allowing them to send their foot soldiers into the Aqua Base, where they haven't been able to infiltrate, well, except that one time, let me rephrase that, infiltrate as an army due to the water thing. The actual finale two-parter features the return of Ryan, the Titanium Ranger, warning the Core Rangers of Queen Banshira's true plan, a ceremony to resurrect demons from Courage the Cowardly Dog's basement. Great effect! The video feed he contacts them with eerily ends as the queen forcibly takes him. Carter elects to go rescue him alone. What a badass, but I don't need Linkara to tell me that. The other four rangers remain at the aqua base where all is quiet until... The aqua base? The Rangers are under attack in what's possibly the most stressful base destruction sequence we've seen yet. The four Rangers morph as they fight through tight hallways and help people evacuate. Dana notices something out the window. It's the Life Force Megazord being piloted by the demons. While they manage to get everyone out, the Rangers, Miss Fairweather, the head weapons expert and developer, and Captain Mitchell are trapped inside as the water begins to leak in. This whole episode is claustrophobic. What was once a demon-free sanctuary is soon to be the ranger's watery grave, unless they do something. As fancy as having powers are, the best part of all this is seeing the rangers be resourceful while unmorphed. They find a flooded maintenance shaft. 
Blue Ranger Chad, as the diving expert, dives down with these nifty oxygen canisters, and they spared no expense to make this believable, by the way. He returns and informs the group that they can make their way to the submarine bay via the shaft. So they all swim there. It's really cool seeing an underwater sequence like this, and even just them troubleshooting what to do while things fall apart around them. They board the submarine, but before they can get it to lower into the water, the winch is shot at, causing them to stay suspended in the air, halting their escape. In a brilliant move, they decide to shoot torpedoes at one of the walls to flood the whole room, putting the sub in water. They also use a second set of torpedoes to take down the Life Force Megazord as it peeks through the newly created hole. As this is happening, Carter manages to sneak into the demon's skull cavern and rescues Ryan. They're forcibly ejected by Banshira. Meanwhile, Jinxer takes a hold of the Omega Megazord, which they show to be immediately in repair after being destroyed in the previous episode. See, it's little details like this that make Lightspeed so believable. Of course they'd want to immediately repair something. Well, that forward thinking is their downfall, as Jinxer pilots it in order to create a circle of stones, a requirement to resurrect the fallen demons during the eclipse. There's this amazing sequence where Carter and Ryan fly through the city trying to take down the Omega Megazord on their own. They finally do by kamikazeing it, and the destruction of their own Megazord is honestly gruesome. But it's too late. The circle of stones is complete. The four other rangers reunite with them, just in the nick of time. They morph and confront Queen Banshira in one last battle. You're too late! Nothing can stop me now! Nothing except us! And that's just what we're gonna do! But the ceremony is successful, and she opens up the tomb to the Shadow Realm. I'm just gonna call it Hell. It's obviously Hell. Or New Jersey. Carter just goes and kicks her into the tomb, sending her plummeting to the bottom. But last second, she grabs him and pulls him down with her. Carter's dead, the episode ends. Yeah, I'm kidding. Carter calls for the sacrifice play, telling the rangers to close the lid. Queen Banshira is still holding on tightly, intent on dragging him down with her. Diabolico appears to help. Not unprecedented, earlier in the season he was able to appear in an ethereal form, so he does so again here. This time, he helps the rangers by cutting off Banshira's tentacle. Just in time to help! I am here to help. Help the rangers destroy you for good! The rangers pull Carter up with a rope, and they escape the now-crumbling Skull Cavern. The final scene isn't that deep, but it really sells me on who these people are that we grew attached to. The rangers go back to their own lives, my man Joel even getting some, nice. They give their morphers to Captain Mitchell, but then a fire truck drives by, sirens blaring. The rangers instinctively run after it, leaving their morphers behind, showing they're not just Power Rangers, they're heroes. Now in a video all about endings, I thought I'd write a long, well-detailed conclusion. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you would really make my day if you could leave a like. If you're new to the channel or old and haven't, please consider subscribing. If you want to hang out with me, follow me on Twitch and Twitter, and join my Discord server. Links in the description. Tell me, what's your favorite Power Rangers finale? Let me know in the comments, or I'll end you!